G'day, I'm Kammer. And I'm Blowy. It's the Kammer and Blowy Show. Kammer and Blowy! Good morning, Kammer. How are you? G'day, Blowy. Uh, it's been raining here, but it looks like we've got a little bit of a, a break for a second, which is good. It was uh, literally pouring down like uh, only 15 minutes ago. Well, I've got no rain here, but it's freezing cold. It's like five degrees. And um, as you can see, well, you will be able to see, there's mist throughout the valley, and we've got a beautiful sunrise happening here. There's a bit of frost on the grass, and... Um, I was actually going to start my um, start this episode from the top of this um, climbing structure, which is over there, but I thought that that was going to be a pretty cool place to start it. But actually, um, someone has gone in there and put a bed in there and set it up as their their house. So, yeah, remember that one that we climbed on at the park down the road from my house? That one with it's got those. Um, it's like a big. Uh, triangle TP type structure with the wires where they make the wires and at the top there's like a big crow's nest and oh, inside there no, I don't remember, some, someone has set up camp they've put like a, a, a mattress in there and they've like put um carpet around the edge so no one can see in so that sucked I should have woke him up and said hey mate I'm just filming a podcast mate can you just let me in for a sec well yeah no I uh poor poor bloke if that's where he's living well you never know what it is camera it could be someone um that can't get privacy in their house so they've set up a um alternative bedroom potentially (laughs) sure anyway it's 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 episode 10 congratulations double digits double digits we've made it so and we're we're podcasting now we've got it all that's um, 100 in podcast years, so mm. that's good. Oh, hang on. Come on, I'm just, um, sorry, I'm just getting a call. Um, hang on. Oh. Who is it? It's, um, it's Ben. Hey, Ben, how's it going? Hey, Joe, how you going, mate? I'm good. I've got um, Camo here with me. Um, we're filming a podcast at the moment. Oh, Camo, how you doing? Oh, I was at Ben as in Swami Ben. Yeah, that's the, the same one. Um, Swami, first, first of all, before we confuse the guests, um, could you just um, tell us why your name is Swami? Well, Joe, uh, I get this question asked a lot, uh, as you can imagine. Um, it started a long time ago, as you know, when I was probably about 16, I think, or so. And uh, I've just been really flexible my whole life, and I was always able to do, I know put my legs behind my head that was really the uh defining factor of why (laughs) and uh just yeah can you still do it i can still do it wow and uh yeah the the you two guys i think were one of the initiators and uh we we uh set myself up for a photo shoot with your mother and (laughs) got myself to do the legs behind the head trick and uh, sit in a yoga pose and I pretty much around that era is when I was started to be called Swami. And Swami what were you wearing in that photo? I'd rather not describe that <laughs> <laughs> but it ca- kind of looked like a nappy. Yeah. <laughs> so Swami it's fair to say that we've known you for quite some time. Uh, we yeah. met down at the skate bowl. Yep. Um, I'll just tell you quickly, This I still have actually, um, and this is very relevant to today's conversation as well, I have a, a very strong memory of the first time I remember seeing you. Oh, that's it was at, good. It was at Humpy Bong State School, and uh, you were walking around, I said, what, that kid, that that skinny beanpole's walking around with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> and, and I went a bit closer and I realised it wasn't a real cigarette, it was like a pencil yep. that had uh, some uh, paper. But it really looked like a cigarette from a distance, and um, it was almost as if you were taunting the teachers, like, come on, come and get me in trouble for, for carrying a pencil. <laughs> yeah, I remember doing that. That was the thing to do back then. <laughs> what, walk around with a pencil in your mouth was the thing to do? Looked like I was cool, smoking a durry. <laughs> <laughs> but Swami... Um, so, 
So, sorry, Cameron. That leads us on to the discussion I want to have today, and that's with you, because you've always been, in my mind anyway, if I describe you to any of my friends, it's always about these wild contraptions and things that you make and your ability to think outside the box uh, with all these DIY solutions. Like even now, I believe that you rigged up something special um, to record the Cameron Blowy show. Yeah, that's correct, uh, uh, Dave. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I didn't have a skeleton casing for this, so I was a bit worried the audio wouldn't come through. So I knocked up a bit of a housing for it and just, yeah, it's, it's working fine. Before we go on, Swami, can you tell us where you are? Uh, yeah, I'm in the north, the most northern island of uh, Japan called Hokkaido. And uh, I'm in a little town called Niseko. Probably a lot of people know about it as it being a very famous ski resort. But uh, it's also a beautiful place in summer and other, other seasons. It's, it's an amazing place. And, and what can you see now for the audio listeners, Swami? Well, I'll just, I'll spin the camera up, but uh, I'm standing in the middle of potato fields. And um, just, this is my road where I live. I just live down there. And yeah, that's pretty much, I'm just gonna walk along this, this back road near my house and uh, try and make it up towards the ski resort. Okay, so Swam, let's talk about some of your creations. <laughs> What's the first thing do you remember like uh, making that, you know, you, you could have otherwise bought in a, uh, a shop or something like that? Oh, geez. It would have started pretty young and I got a lot of this influence from my grandfather. Um, it was probably like a workbench or something uh, to like connect a vice onto. And uh, yeah, something like that. Something out of timber, definitely timber. Um, and Swami, your grandfather, he had a, um, a big influence on you, didn't he? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And he, he left you with his tools, didn't he, when he passed away? Yep, so I got, yeah, I had a whole shed full of old old tools, but my mind was, uh, I, I never wanted to buy any new tools because I just used as much as I could because, you know, everyone used those in the old days, so why can't they be done in the, not done, used now, so. And are you still using that philosophy? Oh, 100%. Like, when we moved into this house here, the old guy left all his tools for me as well, so he's kind of like my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Your Japanese grandfather. Yeah, and I, and I still go and visit him. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, he's a, he, he's a really nice guy. He gives us stuff for free and old, other old tools and stuff. A really nice guy. We're just um, talking about some of the... Like, I remember whenever Dave and I needed to build something, we'd always get you to come and... Um, I'd like to say help, but <laughs> we'd get you. To, we'd actually get you to build it usually. So, <laughs> like, let's let's talk about um, some of the things we made like together. Remember, we made that. Um, we had a skate team, Team Spinal oh. Hazard. Shout out. Shout we out. We made a massive. <laughs> we made a massive um, fun box. Now, a fun box is like a ramp, and then it's got like a platform, which is like a big table, and then a landing. Um, do you remember making that? I do, I do. It was, uh, it was not, not small, to say the least. <laughs> it was kind of pretty big. Walk us through that process, Swami. Uh, well, I, we've been skating for a while till then, I, I, I can imagine. And um, we'd used a lot of run boxes at skate parks and stuff, so we sort of knew how big we wanted it because we, we were actually getting a bit of air. And I think we had a, a kicker already that we were using. And um, so we just had to make the like the top and the, the landing of it. So we just, I don't know, scrounged together some two by fours and some ply, made a bit of a frame. Yeah, and just knocked it all up out the front of your place. I was always really impressed, Swami, with how much stuff you could carry under your arm on a bicycle, like to come over to our <laughs> place after school. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I, I knocked up a, a little jump ramp that was, I don't know, about, uh, 80 centimeters tall or so and put it on my 10 speed racer and rode it down Oxley Avenue and <laughs> take it to your house. Yeah, I, <laughs> I remember as well once with a jump ramp or something you rigged up some wheels, maybe you got them off a toy tricycle or something. Oh yeah, yeah. That you put on the back of it so you could kind of wheel it all the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I still use that uh, method here as well. Made a, <laughs> made a big quarter pipe down at my work and trying to get some wheels to put on the back so we can move it in and out. 
and back then, like, you couldn't go on YouTube and figure out how to uh, build a um, half pipe, could you? Now you can jump on and you can, there's heaps and heaps of guides of how to do it on the internet. Back then, you had to figure it out yourself. That's exactly it, yeah. You, the only way is through a book or something from a library, but there wasn't much information back then. So I think we just, I don't know, used our, I remember we had like a, a grind rail that we got made for our team and it was a, we really wanted a, a kink rail. <laughs> and that's a good example of not knowing <laughs> any, any good angles. Yeah. Do, do you remember that? I remember telling the, because uh, it was from a muffler maker, and, and we just said, yeah, 45 degree angle. <laughs> and um, they gave us 45 and we said, oh, no, that's no good. Yeah. But I mean, we could have had a quick look in one of our skate magazines and just kind of estimated the angle from there, and we would have seen it definitely wasn't 45 degrees because that's a, that's a yeah, killer ex angle. Exactly, yeah. But I don't know, we're, back we're then, on the spot. we were quite young back then, and uh, I guess a, a, a staircase looks quite steep, so 45 degrees, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, now, we also had your help uh, making the uh, tree house in the background. <laughs> in the backyard, sorry. Yeah, that was a, that was a great tree house. What do you remember about making that? Uh, a, a great swing. <laughs> There's a great rope swing in the back of it, and I don't know, I just... There were some, some great stories up there, but... <laughs> well, do you want to, what type of tree was it, Swami? Ah, oh, jeez, what was it? A... Morton Bay fig. Well, fig, it yeah, Morton it was Bay a fig. fig, yeah. Massive, like, the biggest tree on the block. And, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it was thick, and... Um, it had a really good place to put a um, a platform, a treehouse in. Yeah. But it was up quite high, wasn't it? It was. It was. I think um, I think one of us had a bit of a spill out of it. Is that right, Joe? Uh, I think a few people did. I think Lucy had the worst one though. Oh really? Um, yeah. Our sister, she fell out, and I think the ambulance came, didn't they, Camera? Yeah. That was like towards right. I think when we were when Mum was selling the house. And you guys had left already? Yeah, and she'd gone up to see, she must have kept stuff up there. <laughs> and uh, she was clearing it out or whatever, and it rotted a fair bit by this point. This would have been five years after it was made or so. But Mick Gamble as well, I remember, took a fall at a party out of the tree house. Oh, jeez, you got a good memory. You don't remember that? No, I probably had a couple too many Zambukas by then. <laughs> yeah. So Swam, at high school, like, were you taking all the uh, the woodworking and metalwork classes? Yeah, 100%. I wasn't a very good, uh, I, know I wouldn't say not good, but I was a very interested student in, uh, say, maths and science and English. So, I know building came really easy to me, so I just did heaps of manual arts and uh, a lot of sports classes and a lot of art classes. I got really good. You did really well in um, manual arts in your swami. What are some of your accu accolades? Uh, toolbox. Didn't didn't you get like the um, like the top marks in the class or something or? Oh, uh, this in the year I got the best marks. Yeah, for for woodworking. Yeah. Um, but there was that year was I don't know. <laughs> it was pretty uh, average people that were very in, more interested in surfing. I think. Look, don't sell yourself short, swami. That's. You were the, the best the best in your grade. Just cl claim it. Claim it as a success. Well, I, I, I think um, that uh, taught me a lot of stuff of how to do things. So that's, I sort of look back at high school, especially at techniques and stuff. Of how to cut wood and uh, use a planer and stuff. And Okay, so after high school, what, what was next? Uh, a lot of skating, a lot of, a lot of ramp building. Uh, a lot of rail bending. Um, what was the next? What were you thinking, like, like during high school, what were you thinking you'd be doing in the future? I really, I always thought I'd be a builder, like uh, building houses or something, but I know I never had the opportunity and never knew any friends that did it, so never actually started. So, I don't know, the next thing I think we did was probably a couple of years further, but me and Joe did a course in electronics and that sort of paved the way for my next job which was back into building and it was car audio <laughs> so I did a lot of <laughs> car audio yeah and did a lot of building for like custom installs which was great as well
So how did you go from uh, doing like installing car stereos and building these custom dashes and things to using uh, CAD in like a uh, professional way? So yeah, I, I sort of, from the car audio way, uh, it was like the old style of like drafting it out on a piece of wood and stuff and then cutting it and then building it. I sort of had the graphic skills. So then uh, by that time, my new girlfriend's father was a high level CAD designer and uh, sort of pushed me into getting a job in the industry saying that I could do it really easy and uh, introduced me to the software and I picked it up quite easy so I applied for a job and got a job in a uh, engineering firm in Brisbane and I uh, worked there for the next 13 years. Was the money a little bit better doing that than installing car stereos for me? A little bit better First year, actually, I took a pay cut and uh, got less in the car audio, car audio shop. And then the following year, I doubled it. Wow. So it was well worth the sacrifice. So that's a lesson for you kids out there. Sometimes you have to take a sacrifice to get into a higher position in life. And this, um, this ability you have, Swami, to uh, almost like make MacGyver-like uh, solutions from whatever is around you like where do you think this came from i don't know i think from my mother like and my grandfather like just not wasting anything because we never really had lots of money so if you wanted to build something you always go out the backyard and find some find some wood or something that was laying around instead of going and buying more yeah like i remember back in the early days of making grind plates out of stainless steel. I don't even know where I got the steel from, but I cut it all out by hand and filed it. Swami, I remember where we got the um, steel from. Oh dear? Yeah, I remember there was that bin <laughs> that, there was a spoon, there was a spoon factory and they used to throw out all the old- um... Oh, up near Anzac Avenue and uh, Oxley Avenue. Yeah. And um, in that bin, they had lots of scrap stainless steel where we used to go and grab um, like off cuts and stuff they're going to throw away. Oh yeah, I kind of remember the spoons. Yeah, they're they flat. They hadn't been um, like they'd been cut, but they're still flat. So I think I I turned a couple of those into um, necklaces. Yes, yes, yes. You had like four of them on like a. I think you were in, influenced by John Pollard. Yeah, I think I stamped Senate into it or something. Okay, so Swami, this is all leading us to where you are now. Like, um, you had a great job. You were paying off a, uh, a nice house in Brisbane. And then you decided to do something crazy. Tell us about that. Yeah, so after being uh, in a design drafter for 13 years in the mining industry, it was great and interesting. And uh, getting into 3D CAD and stuff was really fun. But... I was always drawn to the snow uh, to come back and snowboard over in Japan. So I always save my money up and come back here every year. And I don't know, I went over here on a working holiday visa and uh, stayed here for a year and a half and worked in a ski resort and loved it. And well, then I, uh, at that ski resort, I met, met my wife. We uh, stayed together for say eight years, well, for first year, and then she moved back to Australia with me. <laughs> and then uh, we got married in Australia. Then we got, uh, we sort of decided that's enough time for her to live in Australia. So we bought a house in Japan. And uh, by then she sort of had also came to Nisika with me a couple of times. So we bought a house in Nisiko and moved back here. I oh, know I probably I probably skipped a fair bit then, but <laughs> no, that's good. Okay, but so career-wise, did you um, did you did you pick up some more work over here, and did you also double your money when you came over here to work? I to Japan, you mean? Yeah. Uh not really. I uh, it was a, another big sacrifice, but I kind of knew it was going to happen. Um, but I had a I had an in. When I first worked here, I uh, became the manager of one of the resorts. And um, when I left, I left my best friend here. And uh, 
he was he became the manager and he stayed manager for the next say seven years or eight years so I always came back and he gave me a job so um, uh, I kind of knew what the salary was and by the time we bought the house I just moved back to the same company and started working everyone knew me yeah and as I w yeah, it was definitely a sacrifice in salary, but it was a, a massive gain in lifestyle. And and how how is um, COVID at the moment over there, Swami? Well, it's Japan for a whole. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. It's sort of a bit quiet, but I, I don't think it's great. Um, as you can imagine, it's quite busy here and a lot of people using trains. But up here in Hokkaido, it's it's pretty much normal for me. Well, what about the um, the clientele though? Because you know, you'd get a lot of people traveling there. So um, I'm sure that it's taken a big um, hit, your industry, is that right? A hundred percent, like we have no customers, uh, only domestic travel. And um, yeah, we didn't really have too many Japanese customers to start with because we're quite expensive or quite uh, exp yeah, expensive sort of resort. Um, but I oh, know we've had to adapt especially for this year and yeah it's starting to become good we might not get any international customers but we're definitely getting more and more Japanese customers so it's, it's looking good is that part of what you're doing to adapt is trying to get more Japanese people yeah exactly because before Nisiko became really famous with foreigners it was famous with Japanese so we it can definitely happen again and we don't want to sort of buy ourselves out of the Japanese market with tourism so we have to be careful and not be greedy yeah because th there is a bit of a um, stigma attached to Niseko I read an article which was saying that it's full of foreigners and they own all the um, all the uh, properties around there and um, it was a little bit cynical actually so it's good to see that you're starting to get Japanese people back there again to make it feel like home for them it depends where, who you are, what point of view you read it from. Um, from the Japanese side, you can sort of tell that some people are quite bitter. But uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely it's de there's definitely a feeling of uh, being a foreigner here. So Swam, you've recently embarked on a brand new project, one that's quite different than, from everything else. You've started decided that you're going to start making skateboards and I think I don't think a lot of people have an appreciation of what goes into making a skateboard they probably think you just get a piece of wood and uh, screw some trucks and wheels on the bottom but tell us about it uh, so Dave just before I talk about that I just I just want to point out one of the best onsens in the local area so lots of people might not know what an onsen is oh of course uh, natural hot water from the ground so, I don't know how else would you describe it? Hot water spring. Yeah. So, Yukokorote. It's a beautiful onsen. Um, I go here a lot. It's got a big outdoor area with a pagola sort of thing. And Swami, tell, tell people what happens when you go in there. Because like, it's a bit different to in Australia. You've got ones where you wear swimmers in there. And... So, in Japan, it's 100% naked. Naked. And, uh, so the men and the ladies usually go into separate areas. Usually? Well, most, most places these days, there's definitely some uh, mixed mixed places, but uh, this, this particular one is uh, a separate one. And um, you get dressed, uh, you take all your clothes off, have a, a shower to cleanse yourself, so you're not gonna uh, sort of dirty the water for everyone else. And then you get in the bath and relax after a hard day of snowboarding. Is the bath outside or is it undercover? Ah, uh, there's outside one. There's a really big outside one and a, and a small inside one. Usually the inside one's hotter. So the outside one's amongst the snow in winter, is it? So you're just sitting out there with the snow around you? Yeah, it's beautiful. So it's really good to reg regulate your temperature because your head stays out of the water and uh, the snow lands on your head and your body stays nice and warm yeah amazing amazing continue with your um 
with your story, Swami? Yeah. Ah, uh, so what what did you say, Dave? It's like, how did I get into it? Well, just more like uh, I don't think people realize how much is actually involved and like why not everyone has their own skateboard making facility. Well, I've been here for three years now and um, every like not everybody, but there's a, a lot of focus on winter sports. And uh, I've got a couple of friends at a couple of local companies that I know that are just making skis and snowboards. And I thought I, I had a look at my mate's setup and it was quite complex and I thought that's I don't have any space for that and um, there's no reason for me to do that if I have a friend that does that and um, no competition sort of thing so in the summertime I started getting into skateboarding again because uh, there's not too much uh, rollerblading over here and uh, I sort of had a look online and saw how to do the process and uh, I gave it a crack what is the basic process so basic process for a skateboard is made of uh, seven layers of veneer, which a veneer is sort of a really thin piece, thin slice of timber, as wide as your board and as long as your board, and about 1.5 centimeter, oh, 1.5 millimeters thick, and you have seven layers of them, and they get they get laid and glued together in a kind of alternative pattern so that you have a long grain and a cross grain for strength. Uh, yeah, and so that, that's basically a skateboard and then... I mean, I think someone listening would probably think, well, that just sounds like you're making your own ply. Why don't you just go down to the hardware shop and buy exactly. a section of ply? Well, plywood itself is not... Um, it looks great from the outside, but it's not great on the inside most of the time. So that's why plywood is so cheap. So you can buy... Uh, you can buy plywood that has inside it's sort of just all mashed together with pieces of uh, veneer that have been cut and spliced together which doesn't give it a really strong feel um, and also it's got no shape so you have no tail or anything like that so it's really hard to bend a piece of ply and a lot of people think that you would just put it in hot water and make it really soft and bend it but as I found out when I was about eight years old or so, it doesn't work. Um, it just either comes apart, the glue will come apart, or you're just pressing for weeks and nothing happens. Uh, so what you do is you actually make a mold, the shape of your skateboard, and you lay your veneer in there, and between every veneer you put wood glue, and then you lay it all up, and then you squash it together in the mold and then you let it dry. While the glue is still wet? Yeah, while well, the glue is wet, yeah. And what, what do you use to squash it? Because um, you're going to need something pretty um, strong or heavy. Well, there's multiple ways of doing it. There's, so uh, you can start with a vacuum bag, um, which you make a, a skateboard mold out of styrofoam and you carve that out of styrofoam. Uh, it's sort of what you do is you actually make the, the upside down of a skateboard if you can imagine that so and then what you do is you lay your wood on top of that and you put that inside a vacuum bag and you suck the air out of it the same sort of concept as when you put your clothes in a vacuum bag and what that does is the vacuum is so strong the the, the pressure per square centimeter is so strong that it pulls the wood into the mold and then you just keep the pressure on that by either checking the, va uh, the vacuum every now and then until the wood dries now the wood takes a wood dry the wood glue takes about uh, 12 hours sometimes about 12 to 24 hours because of uh, it's inside a vacuum area and then you can let that dry that's the easiest way to do it for the person who wants to make sort of a, a one or two boards sort of thing um, apart from that you can actually make yourself a press which I've gone and done and you can actually make a mold out of concrete and uh, as you can imagine concrete sort of a, a viscous uh, sort of sort of thing when it's wet so you make a box you put a board that you've already made from the foam mold into the box halfway across the box and then support it there and then you pour concrete on the 
both sides of it so you have a positive and a negative of the board and then you let that dry and then it becomes basically a skateboard mold and that's what you did and that's what i did and then i, I put that inside a, a timber box a timber sort of press and using a car bottle jack to press the top uh, concrete mold against the bottom mold once the veneer is inside wow and so you've got a dedicated space at home for this do you i've got a dedicated shed yeah a whole shed yeah it's quite messy but <laughs> you know it's uh it'll do for now until production starts to pick up how many um skateboards have you made so far uh so so far i've only like built uh, a bunch of test boards because i wanted to see if the concept was going to work and i wanted to see if the the wood was actually available here in japan so it's been a very very difficult process to uh undertake because of japan has no industry for skateboarding it has an industry for doing skateboarding but not making skateboards you've got a um pro skateboarder to test your boards, haven't you, Swami? Oh, I wouldn't. I have, I have a pro skateboarder in town that has his own skateboard shop, and I have a couple of friends that are really good skateboarders. So, once I make some boards, I'm sure I could stick some under their feet to give them a go. Yeah, and get some feedback. Yeah. Hey, guys, sorry to cut this off, but uh, my battery's looking a bit low, so let me just... Uh... That's a good place to end anyway. Yeah, we're at 30 minutes, so we'll, um, we'll end it up there. Thanks for being our guest, Swami, and um, we'll get you back. We'll get you back in winter when there's some snow around, so we can see what this place is all about. But okay. As we sign off, we're going to punch the camera. So, thanks, everyone. Hey, I'm about 20, yeah. 20 meters from the ski resort. Yeah. Do you want me to pause it and run up there? No. No, Swami. When if you get to the um, ski resort, just um, take a video, and we'll put it on the end for, for people to have a look at. Oh, okay, because it's a good comparison against winter if I do a winter one. Yeah, so just just take a, a quick snap and we'll share it with the uh, the viewers. Okay. But let's let's sign off and punch the camera. Thanks a lot, Swami. Okay, mate. See you later, camera. Well, right, look, guys, this is the uh, my local ski resort. Uh, it's called Moiwa Ski Resort. It's actually becoming quite famous in Japan now as being like the powder heaven um, for snowboarding and skiing. I uh, usually buy myself a season ticket here, but uh, right now it's actually very green. It's a beautiful green with a, a nice mist of cloud over the top. Hopefully I can show you a good con contrast in winter. So if anyone wants to check out my new board company, uh, it's 36 boards. And that's on Instagram and Facebook. So check it out. 36 boards, everyone. Woo!